Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Or, or afternoon, depending on your schedule. Uh, but uh, tonight we look at uh, uh, Theology Matters In. It's our first, uh, first Sunday of the month, the preaching uh, series here. So uh, that's what we'll be looking at. And tonight we'll be looking at Theology Matters In The Home. Let's uh, ask God's blessing on this study. Our Father, Lord, we come before you. Lord, we come as, uh, as weak, as uh, rebellious people, Lord, but people whom you have redeemed, whom you have given strength uh, through the Spirit. Lord, so we ask uh, humility here as we uh, seek to understand and even seek to uh, apply uh, and, and bring these words into our home. God, we ask your blessing on our time together. May it be fruitful. Lord, may it be pleasing to you. And may it be glorifying to you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So, uh, theology matters in the home. And uh, I know this, this basically applies to everything uh, that we do up here, but uh, particularly uh, for me and probably for all the other speakers, uh, trying to tackle this in an hour is like trying to tackle an elephant. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to be pretty broad, and what I want to do is give you a category of theology in the home that you can kind of think through in applying the particulars. Uh, just last week I preached on Psalm 133 where David elevates the beauty of Christian unity. And why don't you guys turn there now, Psalm 133. Uh, we'll start there uh, briefly and then, and then we'll move on. Uh, so as I was uh, preparing for that and as I was thinking about Christian unity in the church, I naturally went to Ephesians 4, where Paul has a big discussion on that. And I realized, what comes after Ephesians 4? Ephesians 5, right? And the household coats. And as I mulled that over, I realized that there is a strong link there. Unity in the home. And I want to explore that with you here tonight. Now, uh, what I don't, uh, uh, I don't have time really to iterate all the ails that have plagued homes and families in our world today, both unbelieving homes and believing homes uh, particularly, but just to whet your appetite, there's divorce, adultery, a failure of believing parents to train their kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and really a failure by believing parents oftentimes to train their kids in anything healthy at all, feminism, and our culture's incessant attempts by feminism to actually muzzle and imprison women outside of their created role, weak masculinity, the need for babysitters, extended adolescence, the list goes on, doesn't it? You could argue that every problem in society first began as a problem in the home. So you see how important it is to get this right, both theologically and in practice. It doesn't do a whole lot of good if it doesn't work out into the practice part. And I think at least in part, the problems of Christian households stem from a failure to grasp uh, not just the ideal, not just the theology, really, but the, the reality of Christian unity and to live it. So we're going to be spending most of our time in Ephesians tonight, but I don't want to just do an exposition of the household codes, although there is a need for that, uh, which are in Ephesians chapter 5. But what I want to do is cast them in what I think is their proper lens as far as where Paul is coming from. Uh, this is what our world attacks, isn't it? This is what feminism and all of its evil stepchildren hate. 
And this is also what you personally tend to despise as a child of Adam and Eve. So wives submitting to their husbands, husbands loving their wives, that's often regarded as a nuisance, isn't it? Believers are tempted by our own flesh and by the world to lock this section up and anything else that has to relate to it into the culturally outdated section of the filing cabinet. However, in Christ, these rules of life are not a drudgery. But in reality, they're a vision of harmony. A useful harmony. So I want to cast these household codes into the lens of Christian unity. And I'll show you that that's what I think Paul is doing in Ephesians 5. But first I want to turn your attention to Psalm 133. Uh, And this will just be like a preamble to help us see the goodness of household unity. David says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Christian unity, even unity in the Christian home, is good and pleasant. I emphasize, I don't even need to emphasize that, do I? It's good and pleasant. David emphasizes it. It It's exceedingly good and exceedingly pleasant. That speaks to two things. First, it speaks to its source. And it also speaks to its experience. First, its source. Where does anything good and pleasant come from? From God, right? For every good and perfect gift is from above. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Unity is good and pleasant because it comes from God. God doesn't create or establish anything that is not good, right? Unity is our creational intent. Not just as a, as a, as a married couple or as a home, but with ev- really with everyone and everything, God included. Humanity was created in unity. As in this, in unity, that's how we are to thrive in this world. Unified together. And what does God say when he creates man and woman? It was very good, right? It's our creational intent. It's what Christ repaired at the cross in recreation, right? Ephesians 2.14, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. So unity comes from God, therefore unity is good and pleasant. So why does theology matter? Because you can't have unity in the home without the gracious work of Christ in the gospel, infiltrating the parts, and bringing them together as a whole. Unity in the home doesn't come from pop psychology books or podcasts about it. And it's not something that we muster up on our own. It comes from God. It's gospel unity. And David's also speaking of the experience of unity. It's good and pleasant. Right? Because it comes from God... You can't get the goodness and pleasantries of it anywhere else. In any other kind of relationship. Unity is qualitatively better than disunity. Why does theology matter here? Because this is what we need to be striving for in our homes, right? Keeping the unity of the household is better than you being right. It's better than you getting your way. It's better than you pulling a fast one on your spouse. It's better than you expressing your every opinion and emotion if that's something that will cause disunity. Now, biblically speaking here, don't, I'm I'm qualifying this, at least, of course, uh, at least how it might come across. Biblically speaking, unity and peace are very similar. Okay, the Hebrew uh, shalom which is usually translated in your Bibles as peace, uh, has like heavy connotations of, of, being, uh, of, of being in a unified kind of harmony together kind of way. But, but don't think I'm saying here with what I just mentioned 
uh, don't think I'm saying here that we have to strive to keep the peace, right? As in how we normally unbiblically think of it, where you don't discipline your kids because that will just make them scream even more. Where you don't lovingly call out your spouse who is in sin because you're keeping the peace, right? That's not the kind of unity that David's holding up. That's not the kind of unity that comes from God. That's sinful disunity, right? But believers need to strive for unity. And then just to cap it off, verse 3, experience of unity. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. When the home is unified by the gospel, in the gospel, according to the gospel, that's when it's blessed, isn't it? That's when it's blessed. That's when it thrives in the life of God. So theology matters in your home because your home doesn't thrive when your bank account thrives. Those two are not connected. Okay, it doesn't thrive when your kids make the all-star team. It doesn't thrive when there's unconfessed sin in the home. When fathers don't take responsibility or when parents are indulging in laziness, the home won't thrive. So that's the goodness of household unity. Now let's turn to more of the meat of it. How do we achieve this kind of unity in the home? What does it look like? So let's turn over now to Ephesians. And we'll see how the structure of Ephesians helps us to understand the household codes, particularly why and how theology matters in the unity of the home. So first, the center of household unity in chapter 5. Now you can break uh, Ephesians into two parts. The first, uh, first part, chapters 1-3, through three, doctrine. I think Matt mentioned this last week uh, about the letters in general. Uh, doctrine, theology, first uh, three chapters, then chapters four through six is practice. Okay, so chapters one, chapters one through three, I'm trying to make it in the right order for you guys. Chapters one through three, here's the truth. Okay, the Trinity has been working from the beginning of time, the beginning of the, or since before the creation of the world, to save a people to himself, a people who were dead in sin but made alive in Christ, brought into the body of Christ, which is a unified body in Christ through that cross, who is a, 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 a abundantly blessed, and they're brought into the household of God. Theology. So practice. Live like it. Right? Live like it. Here's what it looks like to live as Christ's redeemed people who are now made one in Him. So the doctrine part is all about God's work in Christ. The practice part is all based in God's work in, of, uh, based on God's work in Christ. The household codes are part of the practice part. Okay, you see how that follows there. Therefore, how we live at home, how we structure our homes, how we prioritize our homes, it should all be centered around the work, the person power, the truth of Christ. Disunity in the home, therefore, is living in death. It's following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. But in the home, submission, love, and obedience, respectively, are, those are works of the new creation. And it's living in the new creation. It's an output of being made alive together with Christ and raised up with Him and seated with Him in the heavenly places. It's part of the good works which God prepared before us that we should walk in them. Chapter 2. Doctrine, Christ, is at the operating center of household unity. It's the control center. Look at verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands, what? Yeah, don't forget that phrase there. As to the Lord. What do you mean by submit, Paul? That's only in certain situations, right? Well, look at the doctrine. Submit to your husband just like you're called to submit to the Lord. Is that incomplete? Is that only in certain situations? Well, my husband's a sinner, right? He doesn't always deserve my respect and submission. Okay. Well, Jesus is perfect. 
And he deserves your complete respect and submission. Do you always give it to him? No. So the issue of submission and respect may not always be with your man, is it? But when doctrine's driving you, when Christ is driving you, you say, okay, this is really hard. Right? Because I know, because I'm a husband who's a sinful husband. But you say, I'm going to do it. I don't feel like doing it. And I agree. I don't always deserve it to be done to me. But I'm trying to be driven by doctrine and not driven by my feelings. I'm going to strive for unity by respecting my husband and trust that Christ is going to make something of it. Reward my obedience. Husbands, love your wives. What? When she makes a good supper and says, let's go to bed early tonight. No. You pour out everything you have for her. Everything you have. Even when she's the most unlovable. Even when you're the most unloving. Theology matters. Love Christ, or love as Christ loved the church. You think about that, right? Men? You want to know how to love your wife? You want to do that better? Then learn the doctrine, right? Keep learning. Meditating on how Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That will equip you to do as Christ commanded, and it will produce that good and pleasant unity in the home. Children, this is what we need to teach our kids and grandkids. Obey your parents in the Lord. Kids in the home are to be willing and obedient in submission to their parents as if they are obeying Jesus himself. We need to teach our kids that obeying their parents isn't just because, isn't just because we're bigger than they are. But obeying their parents is actually being obedient to Christ. Now, your kids may not be believers yet, but it doesn't matter. He's Lord of all. All authority has been given to him. He's the king. So it's not just your kids who need to learn that it is imperative to obey Christ. It's everybody needs to learn that. So teach them now, right? Teach them the ramifications of disobedience to Christ. Let him be the focus, right? And we're just the middlemen, kind of. And same with slaves. Obey your masters as you would Christ. So doctrine, Christ, is the center of household unity. Why does that matter? It matters because the world of death is trying to teach you its doctrines of the home and have you mold your household around that. It wants moms to send their kids to a babysitter, women to be the authority, husbands to be emasculated, nowadays, literally, fathers to relinquish their responsibilities so that they can kill more babies, Kids to be educated by the state, Disney, apparently. Big tech, right? With any kind of, we're without any kind of parental supervision. Theology matters. Matters in the home because you most likely didn't grow up in a home that perfectly modeled the roles of husband and wife, father, mother, children. And you know how when you have kids... Uh, you've probably found yourself saying to them or saying to yourself after you said something to your kids, wow, I really sound like my dad <laughs> or my mom, right? And you didn't mean that in a good way. Well, you can't just think, um, dad and mom had a pretty good marriage and I turned out all right, right? I'll just do what they did. No. No. You're inevitably not going to match up to the roles if you do that and responsibilities that God gave you. 
Theology matters, and we need to constantly be evaluating everything and even relearning everything that we thought we knew, lining it up with the gospel. So Christ, His work, His truth is the center of household unity. It informs unity. It produces unity. It enhances unity. It cleanses the home. And so now we plunge even deeper into unity and deeper into Ephesians, and we'll take a look at the structure of household unity. Now flip over to chapter 4. This is the beginning of the practice section of the letter. Verse 1, Paul says, I therefore, therefore, like he's drawing implications about what he previously said. And he just spent the last two chapters particularly talking about how Jesus brings peace among his redeemed people and unifies them in the gospel. So now chapter 4, Paul says, live in accordance with your calling, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. In verse 4, he explains that. One body, one Spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Verse 7, now he gave leaders to the church. Why? Verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of of ministry. For the purpose of what? Verse 13. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. And then what's the end of it? Verse 16. It builds itself up in love. Right? So there's structure there. There's structure in the unity that produces, and may, or not produces, it's produced by Christ, but maintains the unity of the church, Right? The, the gifts, and then we're all, all gifted, and um, that is 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 the the vehicle, if you will, uh, of of keeping unity in the church. Uh, so, structure of Ephesians, doctrine that unifies. Chapter four, one to three, be unified, maintain unity. Verses seven to sixteen, unity practice in the church. Then, chapter four, verse seventeen. To 521, we won't get into all of that, but basically further basis and characteristics of unity and uh, specific do's and don'ts of attitudes and actions that affect unity. Put away falsehood. Speak the truth. Right? Be angry and do not sin. These are all uh, relationship kind of uh, issues that he's talking about here and how to be uh, how to maintain uh, unity. And then finally, in 522, you get the household codes through the middle of chapter 6. So what I'm trying to do here is to draw out two things. Okay, uh, the, the household codes and even the armor of God first, uh, we're going to look at that later. Uh, but they're not appendices that are just like tacked on to the end of Ephesians uh, and, and don't uh, have anything to do. No, they're, they're not arbitrary. They're not relegated to first century cultural issues. Okay, They are part and parcel of maintaining the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And he starts with the church, then he moves to the home. And the home is really a microcosm of the church, isn't it? It's literally where brothers can dwell together in unity. So first, the household code, uh, or the household, sorry, is a, a realm where the peace of Christ, because it fits in here, where, or as it fits here in Ephesians, it's a realm where the peace of Christ and the unity that he brings, it, it reaches into the home. Okay, the, your, your home, not just you, not just the church, but your home is something that is, is transformed by the work of Christ. And the household codes here are integral to helping us understand how to maintain and function in, in unity in the home. So that's first. The second thing I want to draw out is that unity requires a structure. Okay? Unity requires a structure. Remember, uh, Paul said that Christ gave leaders to the church in order to nurture and cultivate unity. Most people don't take too much of an issue with that. Most people. Well, God gave structure to the home as well in order to nurture and cultivate unity. 
Wives, submit to your own husbands, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Children, obey your parents, honor your parents. Fathers, teach your children. Slaves, obey your masters. There's a a structure there, isn't there? A necessary structure that helps to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, you would agree that unity is a top priority for any military force, wouldn't you? Could you imagine an army with all generals? No, (laughs) it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. They wouldn't be too successful. Unity needs a structure. So men, you need to be careful not to either abuse your place as the head of the home, nor to abdicate your responsibility and authority to your wife, to your kids, to your mom, to Amazon, Facebook, or whatever else other possibilities there could be, to the school, government, or anything else, right? Wives, you need to realize that too. You, have, uh, uh, you also have sinful inclinations to usurp the authority of your husband and to fail to give him the respect that you are called to give him. Notice I didn't say the respect he deserves. Your desire will be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. Kids, when you're still in the home, in this unit of unity, you're called to obey your parents in the Lord. Paul doesn't say until you're 18 or whatever. And remember, this structure is Trinitarian. It's based in God Himself, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 11.3 But I want you to understand, Paul says, that the head of every man is Christ, the head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Jesus said, I came not to do my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. The theologians call this the functional subordination of the Son. Keith talked about this a couple weeks ago. Jesus is co-equal in everything with the Father, isn't He? But in a real way, He submits to the Father. And the submission of the Son doesn't take away from the unity of the Trinity. It's actually part and parcel to it. In John 17, Jesus prays for believers and He says, Holy Father, keep them in Your name which You have given Me and that they may be one even as we are one. So unity needs structure. Okay, then this uh, uh, then it is, is headship structure in the home. Is that a matter of worth and dignity? Like, are husbands more important to God than wives are? Are they more godly husbands? Are they more talented or gifted? No. No. But in that way, that's how everyone thrives. When the home is in this structure, uh, and husbands, you are responsible to see this through. I don't have time to explore this in detail, but I think it's definitely worth uh, some meditation as we work to see that uh, this structure through and, and, and put in place and, and maintained uh, in, in our homes, uh, you can't force uh, you can't force this stuff. Um, but uh, uh, at the beginning of John 17, Jesus said uh, says to the Father uh, in verse one, He says, "Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you." And then later in verse 22, Jesus says that He passes this glory on to the church. Why? He doesn't get into it there, but for the purpose of glorifying Christ. So glory flows downhill, doesn't it? That's the the principle there. It flows downhill, but then as it flows downhill, it also flows uphill. Glorify your Son so that I may glorify you. I'm passing my glory on to the church so that the church may glorify me. You see that? So, husbands, I'm talking to you. 
the more you give your wife glory, right, the more that, that, that glory for her flows down from you, the more glory you'll get from her. Right? And so as, as you love her as Christ loved the church and equip her in a glorious way to live in the glorious calling to which God has given her in the home, then that glory will reflect back to you. 1 Corinthians 11, uh, again, verse 7, man is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. So men chew on that for a while. You might as well chew on that for as many years as you have left to walk this earth. All right, so let's, uh, let's just do a quick burp here uh, to remind us what we've had for supper, uh, and then we'll get on to dessert. So far, we've seen that unity in the home is good and godly. It's something to be desired and guarded and worked hard for. Because it produces the atmosphere where the family may thrive under God's blessing. Then we noted that unity in the home is accomplished first through the death and resurrection of Christ and God's calling of the sinner. Then that same work of Christ is the foundation which informs us both how to live in unity and also to motivate us to live within our respective station in a unified home. Okay, so now I want to draw out some purposes of unity in the home and why theology matters in that. First, I've touched on this, uh, so I won't spend a whole lot of time on it, but unity, uh, as we've looked at it so far, that kind of unity matures a home in Christ. Just like God gave the apostles, prophets, teachers to equip the saints uh, for the work of the ministry to build up the body until it reaches maturity, to be guarded against bad doctrine and bad people, Chapter 4, so God gave husbands to the home. Chapter 5, 26, in order to model the work of Christ in the way that we can. Of course, we are not Christ. But in a way, we are to sanctify her. Teaching her the Word and leading her in the way of godliness. And then 6, 4, fathers are responsible for bringing up their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. This is our job, man. This is our role. This is what it means to be the head of the home. You are responsible. We're to pastor our families. Someone will shepherd them. Wife and kids. Someone will shepherd them. But will that shepherd make them lie down in green pastures and lead them beside still waters. Wives, your husband is a sinner. And you may be more mature, you may be more knowledgeable than him, you may be better at him in many areas of life. You may disagree with him. But don't mock the effort. Make time for him to fulfill this role. We're not professional Husbands, be an example of submission to the kids. That's what it is to submit. The unified home is a sanctifying home. Second, the unified home is a home that can fight. Ephesians 5, 22 to 6, 9. Structure, unity uh, unity in the home. And then what comes next? You might have to turn the page. What's next? The armor of God, right? We wrestle against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, and we don't just do that individually. But we do that corporately. And corporately in the home, don't we? When dad loses his job, that's everybody's problem. When mom spends too much money, when dad watches TV all day on Saturday, when little Susie comes home from school or the playground and asks you why she doesn't have two moms. Or when little Johnny tells you no after you tell him to clean up his toys. That's a home problem. But when a home is unified in the Gospel, according to all that we just saw, and corporately puts on the armor of God, then they can fight and they can win 
in Christ. When a wife submits to and respects her husband, she'll be willing to listen when her husband confronts her about her sin. When a husband loves his wife, he'll be drawn to repentance when she confronts him about his. When parents disciple and instruct their kids in the Lord and teach them obedience, they'll listen when this world and their flesh try to prompt them to do otherwise. A unified home is a defensive home. Able to, uh, to stand against the schemes of the devil. Though a man may prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. A unified home is a defensive home that can fight. It's also an offensive home that can fight. Right? It gives us a culture to fight with. It's often pointed out that the armor of God here isn't just defensive, but it's offensive, isn't it? The shoes that go on, the sword that slashes, the prayer and the spirit. It's often pointed out uh, that this is the case. Armor of God is offensive. And notice, what does Paul ask the Ephesians, uh, the Ephesian believers to do for him? In verse 19, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. It's like he's got his armor on. You know, he's ready to go out to battle. Right? That's a united Christian home. It's what a united Christian home is prepared to do. It's a unified front that advances toward godliness, smashing idols, tearing down strongholds, conquering lands for Christ, and expelling the enemies of Christ. All those problems in the, in the home that I mentioned in the beginning and the rest of them that I didn't, I wonder if they'd be as, as such an issue as they are today if Christians lived in unity in the home under all that we've seen. If they didn't succumb to the culture of the time, telling them how to run their homes. If men were the authority instead of authoritarians, maybe partly fueling the backlash of feminism, if men held up the glory of women in their glorious roles in the home and nurtured that, if fathers really worked to train their kids in the fear and admonition, the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I wonder. I wonder if women fulfilled their roles in the home with such greatness that the men could go out and wage an active war with the enemy. If Christians really believe that man is created in God's image and that we are to, f uh, to fill this earth with it, then we'd be pumping out soldiers who are abundantly equipped as warriors in the army of Christ. If believing households lived in this kind of unity, unashamedly, not cowering before the culture, but strong in the Lord, realizing that this is what is good and pleasant, this is how it's good and pleasant. This is God's design. It's good and it's blessed. And being content with the blessing that He gives in that. Not seeking something that we think is more blessing, greater blessing. If we model this, if we live like this, if we repent of where we have fallen short, each of us individually fathers as the head of the house, as the head of the home taking responsibility fathers to lovingly lead and train uh, lead your wife and train your kids mothers rejoicing in the security and the status of the nest of your husband instead of thinking that your worth or your pleasure comes from your paycheck if we do this, we'll be fighting, won't we? 
Not just by raising up little soldiers, but we will have something that will either condemn or convince this world. We'll give them something to behold. Won't we? Third, a unified home is a home to behold. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Take a look. This is real, right? You can see it because it's real and it's different than anything else that this world has to offer. You can't see this anywhere else, this kind of unity. But you can see an abnormally beautiful unity in a rightly ordered home that's produced and theologically motivated by the Gospel. Peter spells this out, 1 Peter 2.9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. So when believers walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, people can see it. Right? And not just see it, but be moved by it. Moved either into deeper condemnation, if they reject it, and continue to speak about the Christian home as evildoers, or into conviction. Peter, what exactly do you mean? In what realms of life do we keep our conduct among the Gentiles honorable? Well, he explains right after that. Verse 13, be subject to every human institution. 18, servants, be subject to your masters. Then again, right after that, beginning of chapter 3, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. So a unified home is a home that this world, with all its diseases and perversions of home life, it's something to behold. And it's something that communicates the Gospel, isn't it? Back to Ephesians 5, verse 23. The headship of the husband in the home shows off the headship of Christ in the church. Husbands, keep that in mind. The submission of the wife to the husband shows off the submission of the church to its Lord. The love that the husband is to have for his wife is to be a visible reproduction of the extent to and the way in which Christ has loved his bride. In verse 31, it's a tangible example of God's created order of this world. It's a unified home, which is an advertising home. It's a home that sits like a beacon on a hill. It's a home that cries out, there is a stream in this desert. The unified home is a maturing home, it's a fighting home, and it's a home to behold. So let's have a theology of the home. And let's all be humble enough to all submit to Christ as we are His church and work hard at bringing this theology into our homes. Let's be unified. Let's mature. Let's fight. And let's give them something to behold. Let's pray.